to do a quick uh, show of hands. Who provides an API that that others can consume? Okay, nice. And then who consumes an API? Uh, you know, a public API. What? There probably should be more hands for that one. There's, and I definitely noticed a lot of overlap there. So my talk today is about these open APIs that it sounds like some of you use. And the, and the, uh, the trends I've noticed in watching them over the last few years uh, and the trend in what open is or how many of them are open. And it was really interesting here right before lunch, uh, the gentleman from Orange talked about how very clearly, obviously, their APIs would be open. That's really good to hear because the trend I've noticed is that that's not, that's not as obvious as maybe it once was. So all behind this is, of course, the question of what, what is open, which we'll get into. I like to think of it kind of like a door. Right, if the if the door is open, then it's you're making you're making it available for someone to walk through. Of course, I think there probably are some security folks here who might not like that uh, analogy. Right, to uh, I don't know, you need like a I don't know someone checking IDs at the door or something like that. Uh, so maybe a, a better way to to dive into this is to go by examples and uh, and the past of what we've seen with open APIs. If you go all the way back to kind of the modern web APIs, you have in the early 2000s, eBay comes out and, and provides a way that anyone can add auctions or search auctions in their platform, getting many, many auctions in their entire business is built around being able to build on top of eBay's API. Salesforce with CRM information and Amazon certainly opening up their entire database of products. But then a few years later, we see something different. Anyone remember this site at all? Housing Maps? Housingmaps.com and then uh, chicagocrime.org. They both started this map mashup craze. And they started actually before there was an official Google Maps API. In each of these cases, they reverse engineered the Google Maps site to be able to place their own pins on the maps. And of course, shortly after that, Google Maps came, came out with an official Google Maps API. And then everything went crazy, right? The, the days of mashup mayhem where if any, con any content there was, any data there was, you put it on a map, even if it didn't belong on a map, darn it, we were gonna put it on a map, right? And of course, now there's over a million websites running uh, Google Maps APIs. A Couple years after that, Facebook opens up their platform, makes, makes it able so any apps can go and be on Facebook, and another crazy string of people where everything has to be within Facebook. Everything's there. And so from those two examples of developers running toward each of these platforms, many, many APIs launched and launched perhaps with the, uh, the wrong ambitions. The sort of build it and they will come. And this is uh, clearly not updated because programmable web uh, where I edited for several years is now up above 10,000 APIs. But many, many APIs come in with the, with the idea that it's going to be this perfect world, that they're going to have uh, people use it the same way that they used Google Maps or Facebook. And of course, we being developers who have seen this know that a lot of times it looks a little bit more like this. So uh, even some of those early movers have be, begun to realize that maybe it's not the utopia, right? The open API world, not so great. You take Google with the series of uh, spring cleanings, they called them. 
and shut down a lot of services, including APIs, and now there's over 33 dead Google APIs. And Google has over 100 APIs total, so that makes uh, close to a third of all APIs they've ever made public are now not usable, not supported. And then Twitter quite famously backpedaled on its uh, developer program. And as the next web put it, is prepared to sacrifice developers to get to a billion, a billion users. And then one more example, Netflix, uh, the stream, uh, video streaming service, used to have an open API and no longer provides new keys. So essentially shut it down. Any old apps work, but essentially said that they've found a lot of, so there are huge API companies still doing billions of API calls every day. But those API calls go to internal applications, the sort of things that are on your Xbox. They're on a, over a thousand devices now, and, but the open part of that API is gone. So that's, that's a few examples of, of close, but what is, what is open? So a lot of times, and this again comes back from those uh, Google Maps and Facebook days, the idea is open must mean it costs nothing and anyone can use it. And uh, I think that neither of those are actually true. But that's the best I can come up with <laughs> to say what open is, and I know that's not that useful, not closed, right? So. I'll show you a few open signs. Oh, you, you, you really do want something useful. Okay, how about a few signs of, of openness? Uh, I think open APIs are first of all acknowledged. That's a pretty low barrier, but still, if you're going to have an API, you wanna tell people that it exists, that you're, you wanna show that open door in some way, right? It's documented. Show them how to use it. So not only do you say, yes, this can be used, but here's how. And finally, supported. So one of the, having someone who actually will respond to developer questions. One out of the three is certainly enough. All three is preferable, right, to be an open API. And I actually have a whole talk on what I call the three C's of a of a developer portal, which we learned from Mady was, uh, uh, is a bug, not a feature. But if you still want to work on it as if it's a feature, you can look at the, uh, the three C's and learn the things that I think are important to have in all of those if you have a public API program. So why, why be public? The, uh, you know, the, the age old serendipity reason is that you never know what someone's going to create. These days, there are other stories that you hear, stories like this one from Twilio and Intuit. So Twilio is uh, an a API for phone and SMS, and Intuit is a giant, giant company, right, that does payroll and bookkeeping. Well, Mary is what I like to call the Intuit employee who, on a Friday afternoon, found the Twilio website. Looks at it, is able to sign up, able to look at the documentation, and then goes home for the weekends and realizes, you know, we have this problem. We do payroll for millions of, of companies, millions of employees, and we need to do this phone verification with them. To be able to do that on our own would be, you know, a, a huge investment. Well, why don't we use this Twilio thing I saw? So she plays around with it, comes up with, with a, uh, a prototype over the weekend, brings it back into the office, shows it to everyone, everyone goes, thumbs up, Mary. And with that, Twilio has a big company as a partner with very little additional work. Now, that's a story that I think is made possible by a subset of APIs, infrastructure APIs, like the company I work for, Syngrid, which does email, Twilio I mentioned, Urban Airship with Push, a whole bunch of storage and computing 
services that I'm sure we all use as well. So this sort of API as a product, and there are examples that, uh, that go beyond, you know, maybe face, face detection, that kind of thing. Um, this sort of solving a developer problem and making it easier, developers are willing to pay for that. And that's an open API program that has expanded over the last few years while others have gone away. More and more, uh, the biggest ROI for most companies that aren't doing infrastructure is internal use, being able to expand to all these different devices we have, like National Public Radio was able to do with uh, their Create Once, Publish Everywhere platform. They were able to go to many different devices even though they didn't have the specific um, device expertise within their company, they created this API that made that possible. And the truth is now with all of these devices is that everyone has an API. I mean, we, uh, most people raise their hands and I think those who didn't might, might have just been busy or tired from lunch, right? Everyone has an API because it's part of uh, the way we structure our apps now. You've got your developer, this, this is a junior developer, I think, clearly here, uh, but you have your developer, and your developer you know, is already using SendGrid for email and the cloud, maybe Facebook or Twitter to log in your own services, and you want to talk to your own services in the same way. So you're already creating these APIs. Any app that does anything interesting has to have an API to communicate that interesting stuff between the device and the server. And I think that charts like this show how clear that internal use is in, in being important. This is Evernote, but uh, and Evernote has a public API program, yet still most of their usage of their API naturally comes from their own applications. So, what's, what uh, this, this idea of the internal use and the apps and being able to have partners for, for APIs comes down to another uh, talk that I've given where I talk about apps, partners, and income being the way that we should describe APIs to maybe less technical people as a new way to, the, to what the API stands for. And also, the way that APIs have moved over the last few years. And if you want to see, see that talk, you can go to that bit.ly link there and see those. So if that old API, that open API that I talked about is the open door, the new API or the API of today maybe is a, a knocker on the door. So it's an API that is acknowledged but um, maybe requires some kind of uh, communication between provider and consumer. So the old question that I got asked a lot just even a few years ago is should I have an API? And I think that that question has been replaced by should I open my API? Because remember, everyone has an API already. Well, more and more companies are answering that with no. And as a developer who got excited about Mashup Mayhem, that makes me sad to see that uh, at least our our API present is not as open as our API past. But there are a few signs that I've seen that potentially we might have a more open API future. One of them was a pretty public uh, fight between Instagram and Twitter. Does anyone remember when, uh, when well, when Twitter shut off API access to Instagram, 
Was that what you thought that was going to be, falling down? Uh, so Twitter shut off the access uh, to a feature that allowed any Instagram user to be able to find their Twitter friends on Instagram. That essentially was seen by users as Instagram taking away a feature. And so people got really upset. And here you know that Instagram has certainly gone beyond the, the tech neurati on their user base. So here you have mainstream users asking for an API. Maybe the first time. They're not using it API as the term, but to them the integration is the API. Along the same lines, there's the Small Business Web, which is a consortium that uh, serves small businesses. And as part of their manifesto, they require uh, member companies to have open APIs. One of those member companies, FreshBooks, looked at their data. And so FreshBooks is a freemium SaaS uh, company. And they looked at their data and saw that when anyone used an integration, when a customer used an integration, they were three times more likely to convert from that free account to a paid account. So here again, you have mainstream users asking for APIs, this time with dollars. And then there's a lot of talk of the uh, Internet of Things, of connected devices. And I think that the more that people are wearing them or using them and their data is being collected somewhere, they're going to expect to be able to get that data back and get it back under their own terms. And so really what we have here, again, are customers, people with the money asking for APIs, asking for Twitter and Instagram to play nice via API saying, I will pay you to have integrations, to have an API. And saying, I want to get my weight and my fitness data in one place. And I want the, uh, the APIs to make that possible. And again, they might not be using the word API, but that's what they mean. And so then one last trend that I've noticed that I think plays into this. And that is what I've called unprogramming. So if this, then that, or Zapier are two big examples of companies that have done some API integration that then allows a non-programmer to connect things together. So that's important because if people are asking for these integrations, they're going to also want to have some control over how those are integrated. And if we can get to where a template of, of the integration is created to where they can connect that together, then it will be all the more powerful for them. So, if that's the old API and that's the new API, then perhaps the next API is somewhere in between. Like when you're expecting someone to come over and you leave the door open just a crack. So I look forward to, to chatting more about this uh, the rest of today and tomorrow. So thank you. And I think I, I went fairly fast. So maybe do you have a question? No. How about, how about anyone here? Do you, any questions? Any thoughts on... Uh, on whether people will be asking for APIs? I have a question for the attendees. For, sorry, what? I have a question for the attendees. So how many of the attendees have uh, an issue with an API that Adam talked about? So API broken, API changes, or stuff like that? So many, OK, a few ones. Just, and for this guy, it was a big break, or a small break. So who, for who it was a big break? No, for who it was a small break? Okay, mostly small break, okay. All right. Uh, do you, you look like you want to ask a question. Yeah. yeah. I, 
actually we talk about a lot of um, big player at IPI and it seems that there is a big dependence of small player with this API on the service they built and if anybody decide to broke, stop, change anything, they can uh, make disappear an entire uh, big place of startup or whatever. So are, you're asking that uh, are small players, so if you, if you choose to integrate with a, a new startups API, whether that's a huge risk for Right, right, and so I mean that's uh, that's a that's a consideration everyone has to make anytime you integrate with any API is will this API be around? And it used to be that choosing Google or choosing Yahoo, you know, choosing a big player was the smart move because I mean it's a publicly traded company; they're not going to just disappear. But more recently, it's uh, maybe more likely for a, uh, for a big player to close down an API than a smaller player to close down an API. Um, and I think that if you, you want to look and make sure that everyone's interests are aligned, that you're providing value to that API because that's what keeps it around, right? So, uh, so certainly if you're paying that company, that's providing value. But uh, there, are, there are other ways that hopefully in Augie's talk about uh, um, the, the, art of the, the art of selling APIs, hopefully maybe he has some, some ideas on that. Yeah. So Adam, are you saying that, you know, in the classical business, we often say that you will never, you will never, get, you will never be fired if you buy the big brands, you see? So are you telling that you will never be fired if you use big brands APIs? Is that what you say? Uh, that, I'm saying that used to be the way people talked. And, um, and now I think that, uh, that it's harder to see, to see that those big brands are getting the value if you're using the free API that they, that they provide. And I think we saw, uh, we saw that and then a flip back with Google Translate a couple of years ago when, uh, when Google axed that API because it was being used a whole bunch and costing them money. And enough people complained that then it came back as a for pay API. And so then you could see, whereas before it wasn't clear how Google was gaining value by people using, by developers using Google Translate, then it became quite clear when they started to charge for it. I've got a question about um, the API lifecycle and openness. Is there any, like with Netflix and that sort of model of like making it really open and then moving it back into private um, API access, what, or internal use, I guess, do you see that as going to be an emerging trend or, or are there business benefits of taking that sort of API lifecycle approach? So I think that because of some of the examples I showed before of Netflix having to backpedal, Twitter having to backpedal, I think that's one of the reasons why the API present is not as open as I want it to be. And I think it's because companies are seeing what happens and saying, oh, we need to be smarter about this. Even you can see it in Google's launch of uh, the Google Plus API, which Google Plus came out without an API. Then a few months passes and the Google Plus API comes out, but it's read only and only for public data and developers get upset. And still to this day, you can't have a direct write API to Google Plus. It's, you can get stuff in there, but it's on Google's terms because they saw what others had gone through and said, we need to build this API so that it fits what we want the product to be. And so I think you're seeing a lot more of the reverse of what you're saying, where it starts less open and becomes only as open as, uh, as supports the product. So, yeah. um, interesting picture, and I see that in the old API and new API, there are no locks, and I see the lock <laughs> in the new one. Does it mean security is proposed only for the next API, not see, for the I, current one? I told you guys security people wouldn't like that analogy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a complete analogy, that's, that's for sure. Security not take, is not taken into consideration in the, 
in those photos, yeah. All right. So thank you, Adam. Yeah, wow. thank you all very much. Thank you yeah. for a great talk.